Hello. Uh, <laughs> let's catch you up on a couple of stories that should be on your radar today. It is time for Rapid Fire. And here with their takes on the headlines are Courtney Reagan, Robert Frank, and Morgan Brennan. Welcome, everybody. Uh, first up, Bed Bath & Beyond is trying to solve, quote, purchase paralysis. They will spend $400 million to declutter stores, upgrade technology, and improve the supply chain. The CEO is saying too many options. Overlapping promotions and a lack of price clarity have led to many customers leaving stores empty-handed. And while shares are up now about 8% today, still down about 30% on the year court. So, you know, <sighs> investors warming up to this, I guess, as the day goes on. Um, but it, is it going to make sense for them to take stuff out of the stores in order to sell more? I think it could. Um, I am reminded of Macy's that looked at this somewhat similarly. I remember giving an example at one point not so many years ago and said, do we really need 15 black pumps. Hmm. It's a little overwhelming for folks, both online and in store. They come to us so that we curate fashion for them. Let's give them the three best. And they cited examples where that did work. So I think in some cases it could work. I think you can go too far the other way. Right. But you um, know, here's the weird thing to me about these stories. No one ever says Walmart or Target suffer from having too many options. Why just bed bath? Well, I think in that case, Kelly, Walmart and Target have many, many items, but of many, many different kinds of products. So one of the examples in the articles that I was reading was about can openers. Do you need 12 kinds of can openers? No, probably not. You maybe need like three or four of the best. <laughs> Whereas Walmart probably doesn't have 12 can openers, even as big as their stores are, because they have so many categories. Yeah. So I think that's potentially the difference you're pointing and out. When price. you're facing the existential yeah. threat of Amazon and you're counting can openers, well, <laughs> that doesn't they, seem to Amazon be, has an infinite number of can openers. Bigger well, so, need for strategy here. Exactly. I, I, and I know they're, they're investing in online, but look, when you're spending $600 million to buy back stock and pay down debt at a time when you should be doing like Walmart and putting all the money you have into yeah. online and picking up yeah. in store but and getting bigger on the web, like that's the, so can you know, at this point your your leaders in online are established you know it takes a ton a ton of money and investment should should they even try to pursue uh, that Courtney channel? tell me that the successes in retail are those that have made that shift or at yeah. least combining in store and online exactly that's what we have to do like yeah. I'm I'm just still a proponent I don't think we're going to live in a world with no stores I I just don't think that's true no, all I the don't online know. startups are now opening stores Ex all over the place exactly I don't think the stores will look like they do today I don't think we'll need nearly as many Bed Bath and Beyond is trying to do a lot of things including what you're talking yeah. about online and that is a key criticism for many many years about how far behind Bed Bath and Beyond fell. For instance, the other thing, they, they don't offer buy online pickup and store in their in all mm. their stores, which is crazy yeah. because everybody does that. So but that's another thing that new the company. And I still wonder to, to the point earlier, Morgan, about can they if they are competing in the buy now pick up and store space, they're not the cheapest price. I mean people no, don't they're not, are the coupons, they? but we kind of know the markup is the difference there. Yeah, and I, I, I know they've said that they're going to hang on to the coupons, but they're going to make the pricing strategy clearer as well. Um, the fact that they are making these investments, I think it's $400 million investing back into the store and supply chain inventory, et cetera. But to Robert's point, $600 million towards stock buybacks and paying down the debt. What's the right balance there? I mean, the other key takeaway here is this is a company that's been hit hard, hasn't necessarily made the right investments to this point, but is still sitting on this pile of cash right. to potentially do it. Now it's all going to come down to the strategy and the execution. There's also a lot of assets that they're looking at potentially selling. You probably didn't know that they owned uh, um, Decorous. They own Cost Plus World Market. We Love know about Bye Bye Baby. Bye Bye Baby, know which I'm sorry. Bye Bye that, they could have really leveraged that when yeah. Toys R Us went bankrupt. Yeah, they own Christmas tree yep. shops. I mean, there's things they could do. They did a sale leaseback. They sold personalization mall dot com. So that's $500 million. Just, dollars just those two. Every time I've gone to Bye Bye Baby to get diapers in the last few weeks they have been out so i fundamental retail execution how, the one thing people are going to your stores for you don't have them over and over maybe again. it's coming from china and True. it can't come in on the containers True. i don't know i'm literally throwing that out yeah. there i don't know so don't <laughs> i'll have to look that up but i don't know the twitter masses are coming for yeah. you, court uh, all right let's move on uh, is bloomberg the business for sale a campaign spokesperson for mike bloomberg says he would sell his namesake financial data and media company if he's elected president but he had already pledged to sell if he even ran for president, as Kayla Tausche was reporting. There's antitrust concern over selling to a bigger company as one reason why he might not pursue a deal while Trump is in office. Robert, what do you make of the position he's now found himself in and the likelihood this company is put on the block? So as we learned in 2016, there is no rule or law that says the president can't run and own a business while he's in office, right? Trump still owns his company. It's run by his sons. What Bloomberg has said is that if he wins as president, he will sell it. What the plan is, is to put it into a blind trust, which is a ridiculous misnomer because he knows what's in the company. 
It's a blind trust with 2020 vision, basically, because he knows who the customers are. So, yes, put it in this trust, and the trust would sell it. Now, he said he wouldn't sell it to private equity, nor would he sell it to a foreign buyer. So that gets rid of the allegations that there'd be some foreign influence okay. on the president. But the biggest challenge is this is a 50 to $60 billion company that basically has, if not a monopoly, dominance in this space. And there just aren't a lot of logical buyers for it. Yeah, that's going to be the key question, right? Okay, so who is potentially your buyer? How long does it take for that to come to fruition? Are you going to get market value? I mean, this is a process that could potentially, if, 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 he were to be elected president, could take years. Yes, yeah, could take years. And Absolutely. reportedly not interested in selling to a private equity buyer. He can't. He, he's, yeah. he said, I will specifically not do that or a foreign buyer. So, so you take those out of the equation out, right. and you're left with Warren Buffett. <laughs> right. and, and really, you're left with Warren Buffett. And so, Which if Buffett wanted him to be president, you know, yeah, it's, he, he could, could take it off his he hand. He could help him out. And Warren but, Buffett know, would still have $60 billion left over if he bought Bloomberg for $60 billion. So he's got the cash. Yeah, yeah. you can try and un unravel the conflicts of interest, whether it's President Trump, whether it's Bloomberg. But that's what makes it hard for Bloomberg to take on Trump with totally. the same issue. Successful, Absolutely. exactly, 100%. And so here's what uh, Dan Primack was saying at Axios, just naming the number of issues that would come up here. The conflicts uh, inherent with foreign buyers. Robert, I know you mentioned this. Private equity funds he's turned down. What if two bidders come in with the same price? Is he paying a Wall Street bank? What about Congress uh, in terms of antitrust or any kind of investigation, just as he's setting up a new administration? And who are the viable bidders? And look, the big oh. clients of Bloomberg LP are the huge banks. So anything that has to do with the huge banks, if Bloomberg is elected while he's in office, would be questioned because they are the guy that pays the bills at Bloomberg LP. And That's we're going to speak conflict. to his, one of his campaign chairs uh, in just the next segment. So we're going to ask about this, obviously. Right. I'm not sure if, it, if it's really a debate topic. It doesn't feel quite so much like that, except maybe to draw the analogies between, hey, how would you take on President Trump yeah. over his conflicts of interest? And remember, Trump episode. promised when he was running that he would sell his business, and he didn't. Well, there you go. So we've been down this road. <laughs> Maybe yes. Bloomberg doesn't He's not going to sell it at all. There we go. That's your answer. Uh, how about this? SpaceX is partnering with Space Adventures to send private customers into orbit. Uh, no word on the financial arrangements yet, but the trip would last about five days and is expected to launch uh, sometime in around 2021. Uh, this, as shares of fellow space exploration company Virgin Galactic have been galactic. The stock hitting another <laughs> all-time high today. It has nearly tripled this year. Um, Morgan, what... Why is it because Virgin Galactic is the sort of the publicly traded vehicle? Yeah, if you want, it's one of the, the only space, pure play publicly space traded space names. What's changed? Oh, I think investor sentiment has changed um, around space. This realization that you know this is a sector that is coming to life. The fact that you do are starting very, very, very slowly, slowly to have some of these more, you know, um, public pure play names. SpaceX, obviously, it's private. I. I would not expect that company to go public anytime soon. Hmm. Gwen Shotwell, the president and COO, told me a couple, about a year and a half ago now that the chances of an IPO, they would consider it that when they're doing regular flights to Mars. To so, Mars. To Mars. Okay. So that's like probably years away. What do you think, the market, do you think the market cap but, is the value of SpaceX is? Well, roughly. two weeks ago or today. Today. It's Based about, on last funding round, I think it's about $33, $34 billion. Billion dollars. Billion. So billion dollars. Um, yeah, and you can't play SpaceX, but you can play Tesla. Right. You can play Virgin Galactic, exactly. right? So. There is a unifying theme to some of the stock moves we've seen this year. It's just amazing to me that I, I don't know that it's proven to be a profitable business. I mean, Robert, it's, that's it's, so well, SpaceX out, oh, right, right. old-fashioned and outmoded. <laughs> so you need to well, make money. No. <laughs> I think I'd say two points on that. The first is SpaceX has said that in most years, unless they've had anomalies or explosions, there have been a couple of those years, they have been profitable. Right, Starlink, their new satellite constellation that they are putting into orbit and very rapidly, there's been talk that they could spin that off in the next couple of years. That's something that's expected to be very profitable, according to SpaceX. And that makes sense because that's a commercial business-to-business -business model. So. Virgin Galactic, there's been a lot of focus on the gross margins, even though service hasn't actually started yet, which is what makes that stock chart particularly eye-popping. on the gross is margins. The fact that, is the fact that you don't actually have a service that has launched yet. The business right. hasn't fully taken yeah, well, off Why yet. are we talking about gross margins? Yeah, well, it's barely a business, right? Well, I or, think once you have the hardware in place, it's the services, right? Right, and trying to leverage um, that. But we're not there yet, so the earliest we'll be there is this summer. Morgan's going to be on that first flight. There better be good in-flight meals. That's all I can <laughs> say for that price. <laughs> It's space, space food, food. Robert. We've... Remember space food when yeah. you had the dehydrated stuff? Yeah, no, it's nasty. Uh, speaking of dehydrated <laughs> stuff, General Mills is planning to boost slumping sales with a new $13 cereal. I was rolling my eyes at this until I realized I have it in my pantry. Uh, <laughs> the Morning Summit cereal 
which I bought at Costco, has tons of yummy, healthy ingredients like cranberries, oats, and raisins. Um, but that our price must have been better. Yeah, well, so, so here's the thing. It, th this is the cereal sales chart that tells you the whole story about the stock and everything else. We eat it 78 times a year on average last year, less than two times a week. Compare that with the 90s heyday when it was uh, much higher. So it's not a $13 for a regular <laughs> box of cereal. This is this is a 38-ounce uh, box of cereal. So I did the math, actually. <laughs> it's 34 cents an ounce, yeah. okay, yeah. versus your regular Cheerios, which are about 40 cents an ounce, and some of the specialty stuff more like 50 cents an ounce. So it's not an expensive cereal per se. It's just a big box, and it's delicious. But it's, it says 19 servings in the box. Is that true? I've yeah, eaten more than one serving. I don't believe it. 19 they, they say a serving is box? like half a cup. I and, go through it in like a week. And by the you. way, talk about healthy. It's got 35 carbs, 18 <laughs> grams of sugar. Yeah, I know. It's, a, it's such a girl cereal, but even girls doing the protein <laughs> And thing. you can't even, I couldn't even find a box for 13 bucks. The cheapest I could find was $16. I know. And it you, goes up to $25. But you got to go to Costco, and that's what the, that People is a brilliant it, distribution look. channel. No, I love this cereal. I got it from my mom. She's eating it. I'm looking at this like, this is Morning Summit. I thought I was the only one. I don't know. I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical of the whole cereal comeback craze anyway. I feel like so many people are doing intermittent fasting. So many other people are yeah. doing eating on the go. You've got the overnight oats and that whole craze. Protein heavy. But here's the thing. I think the real play is on demographics. So General Mills is thinking maybe now this generation, you know, uh, population growth and so forth. You look at that chart of how, yeah. when cereal consumption peaked. It was when we, the millennials, mm -hmm. were like eight years old. Right. So is there this idea that you get, you know, like, I, I mean, I had to buy Cheerios the last couple of years for the first time in a long time. I was going to say, it's like toy brands. You pass That's, on the brand that you know to your yes, kids. Yes, exactly. That's the play. You also have to have non-expired milk, which is a tricky thing for me to keep in stock in <laughs> my house all the time. So cereal's out of the question. <laughs> we'll leave it there. Uh, Courtney, Robert, and Morgan, thank you all today. We appreciate it.